heritage. That means that Meghan and baby Archie are not the first mixed race royals. And of course, when Meghan and Prince Harry got married, there was all this big talk about these are the first mixed race royals. Well, my research shows differently. I don't think so. They're not the first. And they, but of course, Archie is descendant, just like Prince Harry is, from Queen Charlotte. Because Queen Charlotte was the mother of Queen Victoria, and Queen Victoria's children trace right on down to the royal family today. Also, interestingly, Prince Harry and Meghan got married on May 19th. And there are four examples that I want to share with you that I consider to be kind of coincidences. I don't know if they're coincidences or if it was on purpose. But number one, they got married on her birthday. Number two, they got married at St. George's Chapel, and that's where Queen Charlotte is buried. Number three, Meghan and Harry moved into a country home uh, called Frogmore, and Frogmore was one of Queen Charlotte's favorite places in the country to live. She built a huge garden there, and that was one of her favorite places. And Harry and, and, and Meghan, before they decided to move to America, they invested a lot of money into Frogmore. And the fourth example of connection is that Meghan and Prince Harry were given the titles Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Now, I don't know whether they're gonna be able to keep the title. There's lots of talk about back and forth, whether they will or not, but it was King George III and Charlotte's son, Frederick Augustus, who was the first Duke of Sussex. So the title literally came from one of Charlotte's sons. So those are four examples. I think that Prince Harry and Meghan, I don't think it's all coincidence, the, the wedding day, moving into Frogmore, I, I'm not sure, but everyone can make their own decision. Next slide, please. When Charlotte was invited to marry uh, King George III, it was quite an event, as you can well imagine. And Unfortunately, her mother was dying at the time that the proposal came. Now, she was still in Mecklenburg Streelitz. Her mother was very ill. And when the delegation of people came to interview her, they met Charlotte's mother. And she gave her permission that her daughter could marry King George III. Well, then they had to get her to England. So the royal family sent a crew, a, a, a yacht crew of seven yachts to pick up Charlotte and bring her across the water to England. And while they were on the boat, while they were out there in the water, a huge storm came along and there was just all kinds of wind blowing and it was storming and the water was blowing. Well, Charlotte had brought her harpsichord with her. And this is a picture, I don't know if her harpsichord looked like this, but this is an old picture of a harpsichord. She had her harpsichord with her and Charlotte decided she was going to start playing music. And she started playing God Save the King and started singing and drawing from her musical talent that she had developed all of her life. Well, everyone on the boat calmed down and she was able to get everyone to kind of take it easy in the middle of this storm. So when they arrived in Britain, the crew was excited and the ladies in waiting that had been sent by the royal family to escort Charlotte to England, they were excited. They said, oh, she calmed us down. She's got a great personality. So that was her entrance into England. And I thought that was such a nice story that she had that much fortitude that she could handle that storm and have people fall, kind of, you know, really begin to like her. Okay, next slide. Okay, the next one after that. So they have the, the royal matter, the marriage. Uh, King George was coronated. We're actually going back one. Yeah, there we go. And after they got married, there was some talk, of course, before the marriage and after the marriage about the queen. One of the members of the court said she had a mulatto face and someone else said that she had a wide nose and thick lips. And so the question of her mixed race heritage would still come up from time to time. But when she got to England, when King George or, or Prince George at the time before he became king, when he met her, it was love at first sight. And according to the records, within 24 hours, they were married and it was done. And within the first 
year or so of their marriage, King George went out and purchased Buckingham Palace for Queen Charlotte. So the subsequent royal families that have lived in Buck Buckingham Palace, I like to tease and say, uh-huh, they were living in Charlotte's house, in the sister's house. <laughs> and that really belonged to her. So that's one of the homes that they had that he purchased for his bride. Okay, next slide. King George and Charlotte, from all accounts, they were really a loving couple. Now we know in subsequent years, King George developed some mental illness and that's very sad. And we've, we've all heard about that. The one movie that was made, The Madness of King George, really highlighted his illness. But he was healthy a long time during their marriage and they were married over 60 years. And they had 15 children. Now that's really, you know, quite a, you know, a feat for anyone. Unfortunately, two of the children did die as infants. And one of the deaths of one of the little girls was really, really hard on King George. He was very, very upset about that. But it is believed that out of the 15 children, they were all inoculated for the smallpox virus and that the two babies didn't survive the inoculation. That's one of the theories for why they died. But they had 15 children and, those thir and for 13 children to reach adulthood in the late 1700s was a big accomplishment because infant mortality was a really big problem. So they managed to raise them. Charlotte tutored her children. They had uh, tutors at home. They had a big musical ensemble that they played together in, and they had a really great time as a family. And King George was very much the on-site dad and very close to his kids. Next slide, please. When Charlotte was queen, she really had many dimensions to her personality. And one of the stories that I just love, that again, we didn't hear much about, surprisingly, was that one day an eight-year-old boy was brought to Buckingham Palace by his parents. And this little boy played the piano. And he auditioned for Queen Charlotte. And she absolutely recognized immediately that this young man had talent. And she became a mentor to Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Now, there again, back to our Invisible Queen title. Wouldn't you think that we would like to know that a woman discovered Mozart? Wasn't that news? Wasn't that informative? I sure thought it was. But she stayed close to Mozart and he, he, um, he composed a song in her honor. And they were close for many years. But there were other musicians that she also supported. And George Bridgetower, this young man on the right, he was the son of an African man. And I believe his mom was Scottish. And he was another talented musician. He was a violinist. So King, King George III and Queen Charlotte would have these musical ensembles. They had them at Frogmore. They had them at the palaces. And they would just perform together. And people loved their music. So this was a part of her personality. She was also considered to be the queen of botany and she had a beautiful garden and the Kew Gardens today in England, for those of you who have visited the Kew Gardens, she was a big part of making the Kew Gardens expand and to get plants and flowers from all over the world that were planted at the Kew Gardens. So music, plants, philanthropy, the queen mentored young girls who were orphans because in England, there was no welfare program. So if a little girl was an orphan, she was in trouble and she had no one to care for her. So Charlotte taught the kids how to sew and would bring them to the palace and show them how to make curtains and other kinds of, of decor decorative things. So music, decorating, all of these were talents that she had. Next slide, please. Now, Charlotte, in addition to the um, things that she did as queen, which was certainly a lot, she was very, very educated, as I mentioned. So when she learned more about slavery, she became quite upset about it. And the queen, through her reading and through her learning and through her relationships, began to develop relationships with abolitionists in the anti-slavery movement. 
So this cartoon here shows where a cartoonist is kind of making fun of Charlotte because she decided that she would not let her family eat sugar. She realized that the sugar plantations in uh, West Indies and in America had people that were brought from Africa who were forced to work without being compensated in any way. So Charlotte joined the anti-saccharin movement. And this movement was started by a man named Granville Sharp. He was the top abolitionist. He's another name that we don't know much about. But for those of you who are historians, check out Granville Sharp. He was quite a guy. He was also quite a musician and he played in the musical ensembles that they would have at the palaces. So this cartoon here shows where this cartoonist, and it's in our book, a picture of this cartoon, is shown denying her daughters uh, sugar. And you can see they're all frowned up because they want their sugar. And there's daddy King George and he's drinking his tea with no sugar. But that's a way of making fun of a very serious movement that she was very much a leader in, the anti-saccharin movement. Next one. Next slide. Thank you. As we know, the uh, transatlantic slave trade went on for 400 years, which is just unbelievable when you think about it in modern terms. But she, she fought against it behind the scenes. In addition to being part of that anti-saccharin movement, there's a story that Charlotte allowed one of the palace artists to do a picture of her and to make copies of this picture. And as the story goes, she allowed this picture to come into Virginia and the Carolinas and Maryland and the British troops during the American Revolutionary War, because I must say that Charlotte and King George III were on the throne during the American Revolutionary War. All this was happening at the same time. Charlotte's picture was shared with people who were enslaved at the time. And Lord Dunmore, who was the head of the House of Burgess in Virginia, in Williamsburg, he had his men show this picture to the slave people that were enslaved and say, look, you see this brown skinned woman? If this is King George's wife and, and he is on your side to become free, they encouraged many enslaved black people to run away from the plantations and to sign up to the British army. So here you had Queen Charlotte and King George, of course, on one side of the Revolutionary War and George Washington and the colonists on the other side. The American Revolutionary War was victorious with the colonists, but after that victory occurred, there were thousands of enslaved black people who had run away to freedom. Many of them went to New York and after the war was over, the British were able to negotiate with George Washington and the new government to allow those enslaved black people who had become free to go to Nova Scotia on British ships. And the place they went was a place called Queen Charlotte, Queen Charlotte Sound up in Canada, where Nova Scotia is located, is where these free black people went. So she manifested her belief in the abolitionist movement in many ways, and she was a real factor in that. And I'm, I'm just very proud of that and, and very excited that, that she had the guts to do that because that took a lot. And in fact, England uh, abolished slavery in 1807. And when the word came forth to the palace, my research shows that the abolitionists came, they had a party there, they celebrated the fact that the parliament finally abolished slavery in England. Now in America, it took another 60 years before it happened over here, but it did happen over there. And she was a factor of making that happen. Next slide. Well, we know that Queen Charlotte is celebrated in your city and that there's a Queen's Road West and a Queen's Road right there in Charlotte in Myers Park. And I've driven over there and, and seen it. And Charlotte's memory is still kept in your city. I also saw the statue of her. For those of you who haven't seen it, it's downtown 
a statue stands. I don't have the street name right in front of me, but it is right there. And I know that a museum in your, in your city, there are several museums. I came down to the, the History Museum a few years ago and did a presentation like this. And you have another museum has, that has put together a, a, a memorabilia uh, exhibit for Queen Charlotte. So the, the word is getting out. And why I think it's important is because young people, young women and young men, they need to know the importance of having social responsibility when you're in power. That it's not enough to just be the queen, be the king and have all the uh, power. That's okay, we can go to that slide, that's fine. It's also important to stand for something. So here in America, we have a number of communities that are named for her, Charlottesville, Virginia, I wonder whether those um, protesters there in Charlottesville knew that they were in a city named for a queen who had a mixed race heritage. Of course, your city, Charlotte County, Florida, Queen Charlotte Track in New Zealand, Camp Charlotte, Ohio. And in our book, you will see many other cities around the world that are also were named for her. So she is remembered in that way. Next slide. Okay, well, our book is The Invisible Queen. If you go to Amazon, it's, it's available there, but they're charging a couple of hundred dollars for it. <laughs> you can get it exclusively from our company, MyersPublishing.com, at quite a discount from what Amazon is selling it for. So MyersPublishing.com is where we, we're the exclusive distributors. We're a small business, and we just decided we would do it. Instead of um, giving Amazon their 70%, we would just go ahead and do it. So that's our story about Queen Charlotte. There's lots more to her. Uh, yes, the king was sick, as we know, and she did care for him. And what often happens with caregivers, caregivers can often pass away before the person that they're caring for. And that is what happened. She passed away first, but her family was all around her. And one other little story I'll share as we close and open up for Q&A. Their eldest son was really upset that his dad was mentally ill and still held the throne. So their eldest son really contested his father for the throne. He worked with members of parliament and he tried to get his own dad thrown off the throne. He did not succeed. And he did not succeed because Queen Charlotte, during the time that her husband was bound to his bed and going through his crisis, I think he had schizophrenia or whatever it was he had, during the time that he was mentally ill, she was really running things. And her credibility must have been high enough that the parliament and the leaders of England trusted her and her network of advisors to run the kingdom and not to let the eldest son prematurely take the office. He eventually got it when his dad died, but he was not able to throw his dad off the throne. And I think that she gets credit for that as well. So those are just some thoughts. There are lots more stories in the book. And if you're into history, this is, this is our story of the Invisible Queen. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Myers. We're gonna go look for questions. Um, there was a, a question or two that I wanted to ask. And one was that you do tell a story in um, the book, you tell lots of stories, but there's one where, um, she does entertain uh, members of the our founding fathers um, when they visited in England, both before the revolution and after. And I, I do think I, one that I found very interesting was that Thomas Jefferson's daughter visited um, at one point with Sally Hemings. And we know Sally Hemings is one of the most famous um, women enslaved because because she bore Jefferson children and and there's lots of, of history now that we know of her but it did seem to be fascinating to me that there you know was a time where in the US we were defining um, race and slavery as one thing where at the same moment um, Queen Charlotte was reigning and where she would maybe having visitors who may have looked very similar to her um, from, from the United States or from the, from the colonies. Um, but I wanted to mention that as, as one of the stories that really 
stuck with me a lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and when you talk about Sally Hemings being there, because she did escort Thomas Jefferson's daughter uh, to come over to England while he was there, I wonder whether they met. I have this vision of Queen Charlotte and Sally Hemings off to the side having a conversation. I mean, it wouldn't be unusual for her to have met Sally. There's no record of it, but I wouldn't be surprised because Thomas Jefferson started going out publicly with Sally, even though she was very young. They started going to concerts together while he was in Europe. Can I have your okay. attention, please? In oh, England and in France. Good. So that was one, one person she entertained. She also had uh, um, Abigail Adams, and John Adams, they came to visit over uh, at the palace. And there's a funny story about uh, Abigail Alice having to, Abigail Adams having to wait in line about three hours or a long period of time before she got a chance to be received by the royal family. We've all been to receptions and you know what it's like. You have the VIPs at the front of the room and you kind of wait for your turn to go by and shake their hands, you know, the governor or whatever it might be. Well, in this case, Abigail Adams wrote a letter to her sister and oh, was she upset. Oh my goodness, I had to wait in this line and I'm all upset. Well, there again, I wonder, hmm, did Abigail Adams recognize the mulatto look of Queen Charlotte and knowing of slavery in America and Abigail came from a family that had people that were enslaved and she knew black people well, even though they were up in Massachusetts. I often wonder, was that part of what ticked her off? The fact that she knew she was standing in line to be received by a woman who had one drop of black blood. And in America, one drop was enough to put you into slavery. 